Ms. Pappenheim, I'm going to pick up at the Society's campaigning activities in the summer of 2001 now. Um, so if we go, please, show me to HSOC 0023041. And we'll see from the top of the page, it's the Bulletin for the Summer 2001, so it's issue two of that year. If we look further down the page, we have the heading Parliamentary Campaigns Boost, and then there's reference to the Society having hired one of the world's largest public affairs consultants, is Weber Shandwick, to help us in our campaigning work. And then if we can go over the page, um, there's a, a column from you uh, under the heading Safety and Supply Twin Pillars of Haemophilia Care. Uh, you refer in the first paragraph to the shadow of VCJD. The second paragraph refers to the continuation of the campaign for recombinant. Um, um, and then the third paragraph says this, this will remain one of the society's main campaigning aims until that policy, i.e. Recomb recombinant for all, is implemented. As bulletin readers will know from the last issue, we're also relaunching our campaign on behalf of those who were infected with HIV and hepatitis viruses through contaminated blood products. Uh, and then reference again to um, the hiring of public affairs consultant Weber Shandwick to help us fight the campaign for a public inquiry and a hardship fund for those with hepatitis C. Um, so a uh, number of questions, if, if, if I may, arising out of that. But first of all, the, the reference to relaunching the campaign um, m might suggest that the campaign had not been abandoned, but perhaps had gone into abeyance or had been of a uh, less actively pursued for a period of time. Can you recall what the position was? Is, is, is that a fair comment? Um, I wouldn't say it had gone into abeyance, but um, as we were talking about before the break, um, the campaign hadn't achieved uh, its aims so far. And so there was a period of stock taking and review and thinking about how how should we conduct this campaign in future? So I think there, there was some pause for thought, but I would not say it was in abeyance at all. Um, and obviously we were talking previously about the strategic review, the consultation going on. So there was a, there was a lot of activity um, and all of that activity was centered around campaigning um, and the future for the campaigning. And clearly what resulted from that was um, the decision by the board to, as it says, invest more money into the campaign. Um, it was recognised through the strategic review that although we had been campaigning very hard, um, using all of the campaign tactics and techniques known to us, we hadn't succeeded. And so the decision was taken to bring in a large public affairs consultancy, Weber Shandwick, uh, to give us more strength to fight the, the campaign. So I think what we were doing was really, um, if you like, reworking, rethinking our battle plans. But I, I wouldn't say that there was any sense at all, certainly not in my mind remotely, that the campaign was in abeyance. Uh, was and then if we go, the sorry. That's okay. No, I'm sorry, I cut across you. What, what were you saying? I was only saying, really, we were pausing for thought about where do we go from here, and we are not giving up, but we have to find additional new ways of, of fighting this campaign. And obviously, one of the important things which we're going to come on to is from that period on, we started to fight a more integrated campaign where recombinant um, and the, the campaign for, for safe current treatment was linked. It was all part of one campaign, which I think you're probably going to come on to. Yes, well, in fact, if we go to page seven, I think we can pick that up. So this says new three-stage campaign strategy. Weber Shambeck have devised a three-stage campaign to be proactively implemented over the next nine months. 
starting with the Carpet of Lilies initiative involving society members all over the country. The campaign combines parliamentary activity with press and media work. Um, and, and then the symbolism of the um, Carpet of Lilies is then described. If we go to the bottom half of the page, please, Shamik, under the heading Campaign Aims, um, it says the Haemophilia Society has intensified its campaign activity with the help of Weber Shandwick Public Affairs. Our campaign aims to achieve, and then the first is recombinant for all throughout the UK, to avoid the risks of future bloodborne infections. And then the second is a public inquiry into the tragedy of contaminated blood products that infected people with haemophilia with HIV and hepatitis viruses. Now, just pausing there, there we see, as, as we saw in your column on the second page, an express reference in the context of the public inquiry to HIV and hepatitis. Um, was that a, a refocusing at th this point in time to make clear that what was being sought wasn't limited to an investigation into infection with hepatitis? Yeah, I, I think um, when you look at the different ways in which we tried to communicate the words that we actually used, as we talked about earlier in the evidence, um, it's my belief that it would be impossible to talk about the impact of the contaminated blood disaster. It would be impossible to talk about that without talking about everyone who is infected. So all of those infected with hepatitis, all of those infected with HIV. So I know that you picked up some specific wordings in some of the documents we looked about, looked at before, but I think that it would be absolutely in the minds, certainly me at the C as CEO at the time, uh, the board which in itself represented the entire spectrum <laughs> of people so to my mind um to my recollection we always meant um, a public inquiry into contaminated blood products for all of the infections that that entailed so i think that feels quite important to stress that the the, the third bullet point we then see is financial recompense through a hardship fund for people with haemophilia infected with hepatitis c in addition to the financial assistance scheme um, in the form of the McFarlane Trust. Um, why was the terminology of hardship fund being used at this point in time? Um, I think it's at this point where we are currently um, at such a distance of time from my current re recollection sitting here today what the reason was for choosing that word, hardship, um, I don't think I can, can explain that by memory. Um, so I, I don't know that I can comment further as to why. I, the only comment I would make is that when we stated campaign aims, um, which, as you've seen in the documentation to date, on a number of occasions, there were different words used going right back to even before I joined the society. Different words were used at different times um, to explain what the campaign aims were. And those words would have been chosen for clarity of communication to our members, but also very much to those that we were trying to influence. So it's possible, but this is only speculation, but using that word, hardship, um, may have been felt to be a clearer way of explaining, but that's only speculation today. So I'm sorry, I can't from memory explain why that change of word. Uh, um can we look at a letter the chair wrote, but copied to you, to, to a, a member who raised concerns about um, that? It's at WITN 1055079, please, Shamek. Um, and we can see it's a letter of the 19th of July 2001 to Carol Grayson from Chris Hodgson, the, the chair of um, the society. Um, and... Um, if we pick it up in um, the fourth paragraph, beginning contrary to the implication in your letter, um, this 
does not mean that the society has departed from seeking recompense. The call for recompense continues to be one of our main campaign messages. The trustees have redefined and clarified the aims in light of the experience and views expressed by members. We believe the campaign is now more inclusive in that our aim of achieving a public inquiry covers both those infected with HIV and those with HCV, as does the aim of securing recombinant for all, regardless of age or, or viral status. And just pausing there, the, 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 the use of the word now, we believe the campaign is now more inclusive in that the aim in relation to public inquiry covers both, does tend to suggest that previously the focus had been achieving a public inquiry in relation to hepatitis, or at least not spelling out that the public inquiry would encompass both. Would, would you accept that? Or were you able to assist with, with why Mr Hodgson um, wrote in those terms? I think in terms of the context, um, I mean, there... The campaign was always a very di divisive topic um, and a very sensitive topic um, in terms of how the society was seen to be conducting it. The, the society had in its members um, people infected with HIV, people infected with hepatitis C. And obviously at the point when I joined the society, the way in which the government had responded to those groups was completely different. And that in itself was divisive. So there will have been along, along the road of the campaign, as we've already talked about, debate, discussion, argument about the balance of priorities and the expression of, of the campaign um, and how it should be. But that may at times have seemed divisive and not inclusive. So I think what we were doing at this point that we're looking at was making sure that our campaign was seen to be and communicated as completely inclusive. I think, as I said earlier, in every single communication we ever put out, um, we always referenced HIV and hepatitis. So you can see that in all the documentation. We always describe the, the tragedy of contaminated blood in terms of its impact on the community, those infected with HIV and those co-infected with hep C or mono-infected. So we always did that. Um, and here, what we were really keen us Chris Hodgson has tried to do in this letter is to demonstrate it is inclusive um, and that is that's a correct description of, of the aim of the public inquiry but I guess what I'm saying is that at times perhaps it wasn't perceived as inclusive and then the next paragraph um, responds to concerns which have um, clearly been expressed on the terminology hardship fund Mr. Hodgson says in the second sentence, sorry, second line, third sentence, as far as the term hardship is concerned, the society has actually used this for many years and refers to the McFarlane Trust um, um, and to a, a 1996 report. And then if we go to the next paragraph, in, in fact, there seem to be misunderstandings amongst yourself and some other members on this term, which you've interpreted as indicating means testing. That is not the case. The society has never defined a hardship fund in terms of means testing other than stating that access to the fund would be dependent on evidence of need. The trustees have not taken any decisions about the way a, a possible fund would operate. Um, would, would you accept, Ms. Pappenheim, that a, a phrase such as hardship fund might lead people to think it, it, it's talking about specific financial hardship, which might then connote ideas of means testing? It's not, not, an, not an unreasonable or surprising that, that it might have been viewed in that way. Well, I suppose um, you need to go back to what it states in the earlier paragraph that in 1996, the Society commissioned this report on the impact of hepatitis C, uh, the Mandy Cheatham report. And one of the recommendations was the setting up of a hardship fund. So I would say that already from 1996 onwards, the proposal for a hardship fund 
if you like, was in the public domain as a recommendation. And it would also be, I think, entirely correct to say that people affected by hepatitis C were suffering hardship. Um, and that that is a perfectly le legitimate word to use, I believe, because we were illustrating in many ways the kind of hardship, i.e. if you've lost employment, for instance, if you are financially less well off than you were before the impact of the virus, that is hardship. Um, and that those were the terms used at the time. So we never um, understood by that any form of means testing. Um, the term was used in recognition, I believe, of the fact that hardship was being experienced. And in arguing the case for a fund, it be very important to establish in the minds, again, it's politicians we have to persuade. This has had a huge impact, economic, social, on people who are infected with this virus. That is hardship, and it's hardship that needs to be recompensed, as it were. Um, but it would be rather a leap from that to assuming that hardship fund would mean means testing. That was not our intent. If, um, if we move to the autumn 2001 bulletin, HSOC 0023043, and we go first of all to page seven, It, it, it appears um, from this question and answer session that the society thought it important to try and um, c clarify what it meant by hardship. So we have the question, why is the society campaigning for a hardship fund? Um, and it says the society's communications and public affairs advisors have chosen the term hardship fund as a means of conveying the message that infections passed on through contaminated blood products are causing actual hardship. Um, and, and then a distinction is drawn between that and, and compensation. And then if we go to the next part of it, would any fund be means tested? The society accepts that the use of the phrase a hardship fund based on evidences of need has caused some confusion. The need referred to in this phrase is clinical need, just as is used in applying for money from the McFarlane Trust. The society has been careful to note the objections from our membership concerning means testing and stresses we've no intention of proposing a means tested scheme to government. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, I mean, you know, the society's thought it sufficiently important to clarify this, to, to uh, avoid confusion. But is it right to understand then that although this phrase was now being used as part of the um, campaign um, by Weber Shandwick, it, it wasn't intended as, wasn't actually in fact intended to be a change from the previous call for recompense? Is, is that correct? Sorry, can you repeat the question yes. there? Sorry. Um, um, is it right to understand that the, the, the use of the phrase hardship fund that we see coming to the fore in the communications around this time was not in fact intended by the society to be a call for anything different from the recompense it had previously campaigned for? Um, that... I think would be true, but you know, as I said in my earlier answer, um, and as you can see up on the screen, uh, clearly there was confusion in the use of the term, which we can see here that we were trying to clarify. Um, but you know, as, as has been stated here by the Haemophilia Society in this and in the prior letter that we looked at from Chris Hodgson. Our intention was not to be advocating for some means-tested scheme, but what we did want to do, and we've done relentlessly, um, whether you use that term recompense or not, was what we had been campaigning on was to show the direct impact and the actual hardship that was being caused to the community. Um, and that was our intent. So. I don't know that I can add more, really, to that. And if we go well, to... May, may, I, may I just ask, uh, was it your understanding that the McFarlane Trust uh, 
operated on the basis of clinical needs which differed from one person to another who had HIV? Yes. On what did you base that understanding? So, my understanding again, I mean, perhaps, perhaps with um, my recollection and my memory being faulty, so um, I don't know that I can add anything at this point in time where I am with my knowledge uh, to what was the case back then. And obviously, the McFarlane Trust had a very well established um, and documented process by which it made financial assistance available. I, in my role as the CEO, was not directly involved in the McFarlane Trust, so it's very difficult for me now to answer the exact mechanisms that were used by the McFarlane Trust um, at that time. But perhaps the only thing I can say is that we looked to the McFarlane Trust that was an existing scheme that had a method um, for rewarding funds, uh, and we would have taken that into consideration. I hope, I'm sorry, but it's, it's quite hard to to um, answer at this point in time um, about that time back then, I'm sorry. Thank you. And then if we go to the first page of this document, please show Mick. We can see under the heading campaign advances on three fronts, um, um, three matters set forward. The first is the um, registration of a new all party parliamentary group on haemophilia. Um, and that's the first paragraph. The third in the third paragraph is the continuation of the um, Carpet of Lilies campaign. Uh, but the second, and this is what I wanted to ask you about, was the creation of a hepatitis C think tank to help strengthen the campaign for financial recompense for people with haemophilia who'd been infected with hepatitis C. The members of this think tank are experts in legal actuarial, actuarial medical and government relations. They'll be working together to investigate a range of financial models that could be used to release funds to the HCV-infected haemophilia community. Um, now, we'll, we'll look at a bit later about what the report that was produced and, and what the society did with the report that was produced by the think tank. But can you assist us with what the thinking was behind setting it up? Um, yes, it was an initiative. Um, if you look at the, the history of the campaign that we've been talking about um, so far today, uh, we had not succeeded. We had not been able to persuade the government um, despite all the effort that we've been discussing and looking at in this evidence. And this new initiative um, took, I think, as, as its purpose, the idea of actually doing the work of putting together a potential model for a scheme that we could then propose to government. So this was um, the think tank that was chaired by Matt Kelly, PC. And the intention was to really do this very, very detailed work uh, to put together a proposed model of a scheme and that that could be used to advance our campaign. Because to date, um, we had received no, no positive response whatsoever from the government. And our thinking was that if we could actually demonstrate to them, here's the working model, it shows how such a model could be devised and what the likely costs might be that that would give us, if you like, um, a new campaign strategy to be able to influence the government um, and to show here is a solution which potentially we could propose um, through um, parliamentary supporters to be able to offer a solution as the government to date had shown nothing, no response whatsoever. No sign of looking into this, no sign really of, of taking the matter forward. So in a way, what we wanted to show is this can be done by an expert think tank. 
here are our proposals, come and discuss them with us. Now we can see from this the, the, um, the, the range of experience of those who were on the think tank. The, the think tank, or, or I think the, it came to be known as the Hepatitis Working Group, um, didn't include those who were themselves infected with hepatitis or HIV through treatment for bleeding disorders, or, or any family members of those who had been infected or who had died. Wh why did the society not include in this think tank or group um, individuals who could convey that lived experience? The purpose of the group was very technical. Um, so, as you say, you, we were going to have a look in a minute at um, the mix of individuals who were on the, the think tank. So, it was a very technical group um, which was tasked with the technical exercise of working out the mechanisms by which the scheme, a scheme, a potential model um, might work. So the membership of the group was determined on that basis and it, it wasn't part of the remit uh, in determining the membership at that time, but it should also include people who were affected um, by the conditions. In, in, with hindsight, do, do you think now that perhaps it should have included people who were themselves most directly and, and intimately affected? With hindsight, um, I, um, I don't believe that the outcome of that work would necessarily have been any different um, because it was, it was a very technical piece of work um, and it was looking at doing the modelling based on numbers, based on um, examples of other schemes that operated elsewhere. So I'm not sure whether the outcome would have been different or not. But as it is, that was, that was the working group um, and, and that was the work that it produced. If we look at a Board of Trustees meeting from November 2001, it's at HSOC 00296890041. underscore zero four one. Please show me. We can see this is the Board of Trustees meeting, 29th of November 2001. If we go to page five... Sorry, page four. We can see there towards the bottom of a page, the page is the heading campaign, and there's a report from Weber Shanwick produced. I'm, I'm not proposing to ask you about that, but if we go to the next page, halfway down the page, you'll see in bold the heading B, to consider the report produced by the HCB think tank on a possible financial assistance scheme for people with hepatitis C. And then we can see the minutes record you introducing a member of the think tank. There's reference to an interim confidential report from the think tank indicating um, the cost of adopting the Canadian scheme. Um, and then um, the fourth paragraph under that heading, trustees felt that the views of affected people should be sought on the proposals and asked the chief executive to undertake this, bearing in mind the need for confidentiality. Um, was that step taken? Um, what were the views of affected people sought on the proposals set out in the interim confidential report? I actually, I can't remember um, at this point in time what happened about that. Sorry, I, I can't illuminate that. So, um, would this be right? If, to, if the views of... of affected people, which would be presumably, uh, um, at the very least, members who were infected with HCV or whose family members have been infected with HIV, there should be documentary reference to that somewhere. Um, yes, okay. yes, but I'm afraid I, I can't remember, no. but clearly it's in the minute. Um, 
So I imagine something would have taken place. Um, and, and then if we go over the page, we can see in the top half of the page um, um, a discussion about the aims of the campaign. Um, so recombinant, it's agreed following discussion that the campaign for recombinant should, for all should be continued. Financial recompense, it was agreed that the society continue to progress the campaign for recompense for people infected with HCV. Um, and then public inquiry, it was agreed that the two main objectives, the call for recombinant for all and the call for financial recompense, should take priority, but the call for a public inquiry will not be dropped. So it, it, it's, I think, is it right to say we see there the call for a public inquiry taking a back seat? Is that a fair way of, of, of putting it? It's not, it's not being abandoned as a campaign aim. Um, but it's not going to be pushed forward um, with the same degree of, of, of urgency as the other two at this point in time. It's very difficult to say because um, I imagine that you know this this is a minute of probably quite a difficult discussion, um, which I think is indicated by the wording each trustee was asked their views on each. So. Um, yeah, I, I think it's quite difficult to comment that that might have been the implication there. And obviously, it is as written, but in the context of what I think was quite a difficult meeting about the campaign. If, if we move forward to the next Board of Trustees meeting, which was January 2002, we can see that at HSOC 00296890042. underscore zero four two. Um, so we, we have the date there, um, the 16th of January 2002. If we go to the third page, bottom half of the page, what we can see set out in italics is a memo from you raising concerns about the process of decision making at the last board meeting with regard to investment in the campaign. You, you refer to the um, cost of continuing to engage Weber Shandwick and you say more in relation to that about the in the second paragraph um, uh, uh, and then uh, in the third paragraph you say it might be argued that these very large sums of money could have been spent instead on providing information advice and support services for people with haemophilia von Willebrands and their families uh, as was noted at the last board meeting, due to a lack of committed funding, we're not going ahead with either our women's or youth development projects. In effect, a decision was made at the last board meeting that spending on the campaign is a far higher priority than development of services such as these. If it is the board's view that spending on the campaign is the major priority, possibly at the expense of our service development, I feel this needs to be reviewed at an early stage in the new year with a much fuller consideration of the other options that exist for use of our reserves. And then if we go over the page you set out con concerns there about the society's financial position. So can you just assist us with, with I mean, what, what led you to raise with the board in these terms your concerns about, essentially, about whether the board had taken the right decision at the previous meeting? Hmm. Well, I think it, it goes back to... Um what I said earlier in the day that um, the charity and its trustees are in were in the situation that funding resources and human resources funding resources were limited um, as we'd seen earlier um, my my tenure had started with some reduction in in uh, government funding so funds were constrained. Um, as CEO, I was responsibly advising the board that the decision to invest that uh, additional money in the campaign would have to mean revising our budgets and thinking about if the priority of the trustees is to spend more on the campaign, which of course it is absolutely the trustees decision to do that. It does mean revising budgets um, because we weren't going to be given any additional new funds from somewhere else, so it would mean revising the budgets. 
Um, there is, as is stated here, 2001 accounts would show a deficit. So funding constraints were very genuine. Um, you can see, I'm not going to read it all out, but fundraising may not have brought in as much money uh, as we would have needed. Uh, we were facing an increase in the rent and reserves not being replaced at the same rate as we were spending them. So I was a CEO advising the trustees to be careful to reflect that the commitment to spend more on the campaign would mean revising our budgets. Um, and as I, it says on the prior page, it would be possible that by spending more money on the campaign, less would be spent on service provision. And that really was the tension that would exist um, all through um, my tenure in, in the charity. The balance of how funds should be allocated to service provision for support through service provision and the funds that should be allocated to campaigning. So um, that was my purpose in raising this issue and asking that it should be reviewed again because obviously it was a decision that had considerable financial implications and those would need to be looked at. Uh, you note also that um, I was suggesting that given the financial position, um, which was probably not um, as healthy as might be wished, that there would need to be planning as well as revising the budget to look at best and worst case financial scenarios and the risk factors, because at the end of the day, the charity's trustees do need to be mindful of the financial sustainability of the charity and of the impact of financial decisions they take. So that, that, that was my purpose, I think. Um, and it's, it's set out quite clearly in that document that you've got on screen. We'll look at what the board decided at the next meeting in a, in, in a few moment, minutes, but um, just sticking with this document, if we go to the next page, um, if we can zoom in on the top half of the page, um, there's a paragraph two, conduct of trustees. Um, it says this, the CEO, so that's you, had expressed concern that the minutes of the Tayside Group's AGM stated that Philip Dolan had told the meeting that in Scotland we're still campaigning for compensation and not financial recompense or assistance or hardship fund. She said she'd expected him as trustee to take the opportunity to explain that the society no longer used the term hardship and added that there was a need for the society to present a consistent message. And then there's reference to, to, to the matter will be discussed um, more fully together with the wider subject of devolution later in the meeting. But before we look at that later discussion, this records you um, expressing the view that, that Philip Dolan um, should have explained in Scotland that the society no longer used the term hardship. Now, we've seen just a few min months previously the society's own publications using the terminology hardship fund um, and hardship in the sense you've described. Um, and indeed, you've told us it was quite important to use the term hardship because it conveyed the serious um, situation, the grave situation in, in, in which many found themselves. W why is it then being recorded here that the society no longer used the term hardship? Um, I find it difficult, actually, at this remove of time um, quite to understand the, the meaning of this minute. Um, I mean, what I can see here is that it's recorded that there was a meeting at which these different terms were used. But it is quite hard for me to, to comment at this distance of time. I think what this illustrates is that every word used was very emotive and potentially generated um, debate, let's say, but I can't really add to why the, that specific minute is, is as it is. I think the general point here was around the notion that as trustees, as it says under the 
the start of this item. The general sense of this is that trustees would be expected to take a form of cabinet responsibility. So by that, what was meant is that as a trustee of the charity, you may be party to discussions and decisions as a board member, as a trustee board member, with which perhaps you personally do not agree. You have that right as a trustee to express your dissent at the board meeting, and possibly that was the case with Philip Dolan. But where we were talking about cabinet responsibility, it was that sense that having been part of the board and a decision taken at the board, we would then hope that trustees would support the board's decisions when they went out into the wider world. So I think that was more the sense um, of what this was about, but I, I can't <laughs> illuminate any further <laughs> what that particular um, minute if we go to the next page, we can then pick up on the, the, the discussion on devolution in Scotland. So, top half of the page, under the heading Scotland, further discussion took place. It was noted there were divergences in the content of campaign aims as stated in Scotland, specifically that the term compensation was used in preference to recompense. It was recognised that tensions had developed between Scottish members and the society over this matter, and some of the society's groups had indicated to the CEO that they no longer wish to work with the National Society on the campaign. It was agreed that the broader matter of devolution and the possibility of reviewing this again with members should be discussed when more time was available. Now that oh, minute uh, largely speaks for itself, but what, 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 what can you tell us about the divergence between the society's campaign aims and um, the campaign aims of, of society members or groups within Scotland? And h how, if at all, was, was that divergence addressed? I'm not sure that I can illuminate further today, sitting here now. Um, I think this this minute, this note here, um, describes what, what undoubtedly was the case, that there were divergences, there were disagreements, there were very, very strong feelings. I mean, at the end of the day, um, what we all were trying to achieve, I believe, um, was to persuade the government, whether it were Westminster or Scotland, that some form of recognition, financial recognition of the loss suffered by this community. We were all trying to do that, I believe, um, and the government was the organisation or the agency that we were trying to persuade, but clearly there were very strong feelings about what form should that financial recognition take? Um, and then that would boil down to some people felt very passionately compensation. Some would argue for recompense. Um, and sitting here now, so many years later, I think it's quite hard to imagine why, why those words became so emotive and so loaded when at the end of the day, all of us were trying to persuade governments who were not responding to do something in the form of financial recognition of, of the devastating impact of the virus and viruses on this community. So I think it it is quite difficult now to, to go back into what the frame of mind and, and what it was like at the time. But all I can say really is that this illustrates how emotive it was and how strongly how strong were the feelings about the words if, if we go to the next trustees meeting March of 2002 show me it's HSOC 0029689 underscore 043 And we can see minutes of a Board of Trustees meeting, 20th of March 2002. If we go to the second page and look at the bottom half of the page, under the heading campaign, we see reference to a progress report from Weber Shandwick, um, the January-March campaign report. 
The report was well received and noted it was explained that whether Shandwick was focusing on a submission to the Chancellor in advance of the budget setting, setting uh, in advance of the budget setting out the case of provision for recombinant for all. And it was noted Budget Day was also World Haemophilia Day. It was noted that a valuable meeting had been held with supporting MPs and Health Minister Yvette Cooper. The CEO reported that the minister had asked the society whether recombinant or recompense for hepatitis was a greater priority for members, a question which possibly indicated that a limited amount of money might be available. Now, now these minutes record you reporting that question being posed by the health minister, I Yvette Cooper, but they don't record what the society's answer was, or indeed whether the society gave an answer. Are, are you able to assist with what, if any, response was given by the society to the question posed by the minister? Um, no, not from memory, but I think you should be, this was an official meeting between us and the minister, so I would assume that there is a civil service note um, that you could obtain of what was said. Um, and that is a very challenging question for the minister to ask, is it not? Because um, we knew that our members wanted all of it, recombinant and recompense. Um, so I could only, I can't add anything from recollection, but I hope you can get an official minute from um, civil service. If we go to the next page then, and we move on to the item HCB think tank report. So it's the paragraph B, um, to consider final report and agree next step. So it records you giving a presentation on the final report um, um, and a discussion um, about um, the report. There's then set out in the next paragraph the proposed next steps. Um, seek meeting with government to present proposals, consider joint approach with McFarlane Trust, etc. Um, and then this, trustees then discuss the question of at what stage should the society inform slash consult members? It was noted that there would be opportunities for feedback at the AGM conference and via the HQ newsletter in the summer and autumn. And there's reference to setting up a management panel um, and a, a number of steps. Uh, and then it says it was also agreed that in the event that any settlement were offered by government, trustees would have to consult the membership before accepting such an offer. Now, if we just go back to the sentence, trustees then discuss the question of at what stage should the society inform slash consult members. It, it, that might suggest, Ms. Pappenheim, that the consultation with members that the trustees asked should be undertaken once when the society had the interim report had not been undertaken um, and the question of consulting members is, is arising afresh here. Is that the right inference to draw or are you not able to assist? I can't speculate on that. I'm sorry, but I, I cannot speculate on that um, and I don't have from memory um, any information to share on, on what that was about. And the, the next sentence, it was noted that there would be opportunities for feedback at the AGM conference and via the newsletter, again, might suggest that those were going to be the opportunities for members to say something rather than any separate consultation process. Is, again, is that a fair inference to draw? Well, they clearly were opportunities. Um, and I think um, we would have been very well aware that those face-to-face -face opportunities, um, such as the AGM, would give us uh, and give members a chance to speak directly with us. So that's a face-to-face. -face. Um, obviously, communication opportunities in writing through the newsletter. Um, but yes, uh, those were ways which we were intending to use clearly to, to consult and inform members. And then just to complete the picture in terms of decision on, on the future of campaigning work, if we look at the paragraph at the bottom of the page, you gave a presentation outlining the options available for the future of the society's campaigning work, assuming that the current campaign on the impact of contaminated blood products would be much scaled down or even ended in the next 12 months. 
It was agreed that resourcing slash staffing of campaigning slash public affairs functions was dependent on the future direction of campaigning and that the society could not sustain further spending on campaigning at the current levels. The CEO's proposals therefore reflected the need to save substantial costs whilst ensuring the society still had access to the necessary skills. Trustees considered the four options proposed by the CEO. And then over the page, we can see four options set out. A is to create an in-house post um, of press information officer. B, to create an in-house post of campaigns parliamentary officer. C is to redistribute functions to other team members. And we see below A and B are dismissed because it would cost too much. C is dismissed as being um, not being feasible. And so the trustees endorsed option D, which was use single lower cost freelancer for selected public affairs slash campaign functions. Um, so uh, um, whether Shandwick would no longer be involved and as and when the society wanted uh, assistance, it, it would it engage someone on, on a freelance basis. Is, is that right? That's it. And um, I think you've summarised it uh, exactly right. Um, obviously, as I said in an earlier answer, resources, the charity's resources were strained um, and hence looking at lower cost options. Um, and, and then the final set of board minutes I want to ask you about in terms of the campaign campaigning activities um, are the June 2002 minutes. Those are at HSOC 0029689 underscore 045. So we can see the date is uh, 21st of June 2002, minutes of the Board of Trustees meeting. If we go to the third page and we look at the heading campaign A, to receive an update from Weber Shandwick and the Chief Executive Trustees, discuss the report from Weber Shandwick and additional information from the CEO regarding a meeting with Health Minister Hazel Blears earlier that week to present the report of the HCB think tank. The Minister had stressed to the Society representatives that the government had no plans to change its policy on financial assistance, but given the amount of work that had been undertaken by the HCB think tank, the report would be given to the government's financial experts. An early day motion had been put down in Parliament asking the government to support the findings of the HCB think tank, etc. Um, so I think it's probably right to understand from this that the, that the decision was to um, present that report, which we'll look at in a moment, to the minister, now Hazel Blears. Um, ha had there been any consultation, as far as you can recall, with members about the content of the report in the intervening period? You'll recall that the last set of minutes we looked at talked about opportunities through the AGM and the newsletter, but between that meeting and this meeting, there wouldn't have been that much time. Is it right to understand that the report was presented to the minister without members having been given the opportunity to give any kind of detailed feedback on it? I'm afraid I can't comment on that from memory. Um, so I, I don't think I can add anything further to what, what's been written here. Um, I note that it's stated in the minute that uh, the report offered an example of a possible financial assistance scheme. It was based on the scheme in Canada um, and it was based on considering levels of awards so it was put forward as an example but bear in mind that um, the decision as to whether any scheme would be incorporated adopted or whether any notice was taken of this report that decision ultimately rested with the government um, so I think that's the situation we were in but I can't add any more information I'm afraid to what consultation may have taken place and then if we just look at the bottom of the page under the heading to discuss communication to members about the future of the campaign trustees agreed it was important to explain to members that the society's financial situation requires that the level of resource devoted to the campaign be reduced experience indicates that there's little or no hope of winning a public inquiry or recompense for hcv unless there are dramatic developments in scotland the board still intends to keep fighting for recombinant and for the best possible treatment and care for all people with haemophilia and von Willebrands. There's also a need to do more to meet the other needs of the haemophilia von Willebrands community and the continued focus on the campaign is preventing this. Um, 
So is it right to understand um, from this that, that um, by this point in time, June 2002, um, the society is no longer going to be devoting resources to either the public inquiry or objective or the HCV recompense objective in the absence of, as I set out there, dramatic developments in Scotland? Um, I wouldn't want to put any speculation around what is actually written there because um, I don't think I can contribute anything from memory today to what was written there. So I'm afraid I would just like to stick to the record with what was written there. I can't speculate and I have no recollection to add to that, I'm afraid. If we go then to the... Um, the think tank report or the hepatitis C working party report shown that it's at HSAC 305927. Um, we can see it's dated June 2002. If we go to page four, we can see the membership of the working party, um, um, which in included. Um, you as, as chief executive of the Haemophilia Society. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through the, the, the detail of the re, um, report or the, or the calculations um, with you, um, but can I ask th this? Other than giving this report to Hazel Blears, as we saw from those June 2002 Board of Trustees uh, mi meeting minutes, what else, if anything, was done with the report? Um, from memory, I cannot say, so I'm, I wouldn't be able to offer any um, illumination on that. I mean, obviously, it was a lot of work that went into it. You can see that it was very technical. You can see the membership. You can see the basis on which the report was produced. But um, I cannot and there may be records that exist somewhere within the, the Haemophilia Society, but I can't recall today what else may have been done with that report. I'm sorry, I can't add any more on that. We, we know from what we've looked at that this report and that the think tank um, uh, modelled its calculations on, on what it understood the position to be in Canada. Can you um, assist with what, if any, consideration was given by the working party to the model of financial assistance in the Republic of Ireland? I think the report probably speaks for itself. So um, again, this is a very, very technical area. Um, and the report, I believe, if you go through it, talks about um, how, how the decisions were taken, what the assumptions were. So I can't add anything to this. I think the report actually speaks for itself in it's a coherent piece of work which makes an argument for the model that this working group decided to adopt. But it is all explained, I believe, in the report itself. Now, the inquiry has seen and, and indeed shared with you um, some um, critical negative responses to the report from members. Um, um, I think the term... Uh, a, a shut up and die pittance is one of the phrases that's used in, in, in the correspondence. C can you recall more broadly what the reaction of members was to the report? I can't from memory. I mean, obviously, you, you have cited there some responses from some members. Um, how many members you're you're speaking for, I, in effect, I couldn't say. So I think it's very hard to know. I certainly can't recall what reaction there, there was, if there was much of a reaction, or if some people had a very strong reaction and others little reaction. All of those things are possible, but I'm afraid I, I just can't remember. I, I can't remember the response um, that there may have been at that point in time. 
we can take that down, thank you. Now, it, it was over a year later in August of 2003 that the announcement was made in Scotland and then a companion announcement made um, by John Reid, the then Secretary of State for Health, um, uh, uh, um, about the provision of some form of financial recompense. Um, perhaps we'll just look at one document in relation to that which records your response. It's HSOC 303277. Um, so, statement from the Haemophilia Society following the Scottish Health Minister's announcement uh, that he would like to offer compensation to those infected with hepatitis C. Um, and you're recorded as welcoming um, the Health Minister's agreement with the principle of offering financial assistance. Disappointment that the figures fall far short of the payments proposed by the expert group, that's the, the Ross group, um, uh, and, and no provision made for surviving dependents of those who died. And then if we go to the next page. We can see um, uh, the Haemophilia Society responding uh, to the announcement by John Reid that the government will set up a financial assistance scheme for people with haemophilia infected with hepatitis C. Uh, and we have their Lord Morris on behalf of the society um, um, making a statement in response to that, a major breakthrough for 20 years of campaigning. Do, do you recall um, whether, from the society's perspective, this announcement in August 2003 came out of the blue from the Scottish and Westminster governments, or, or had the society been involved in, in the government's decision-making? You were talking specifically about... Sorry, I may not have completely Sorry. understood so the in question. August in August 2003, the Scottish government and the, the Westminster government, in the latter case through John Reid, announced that they would set up a financial assistance scheme. Yes. Um, did the society, um, did that come as a out of the blue from the society's perspective? I think that it did, actually. Um, but, you know, that, that is my feeling sitting here today. Um, I think in some of the documents there's a, um, a memo with my name which talks about great news. Um, so, obviously, it was a, a huge breakthrough to finally have achieved some sort of financial assistance scheme at long last all the years of campaigning but I, I think it came as, as news to us um, but that is my that's my memory today so memory may be faulty and, and w w were you ever given um, within the society any insight into why um, the, the, the respective government Scotland and, and, and the UK government and, um, had changed its position in, in that respect I think it's an interesting question, which um, I don't believe that we were given that kind of insight. Um, certainly, I have no knowledge of such insight now uh, and what might have led to the change. But perhaps now, you'll be able to gain intelligence from some of those who were actually on the inside of government at the time. Now, we, we know that this scheme became the Skipton Fund and you were involved in um, a handful of meetings in the autumn of 2003. You attended a meeting with Peter Stevens. Um, you attended um, uh, a meeting with Department of Health representatives and, and, and corresponded with Richard Gotowski at the Department of Health setting out the society's concerns in a number of respects about the limitations and parameters of the scheme. We, we've got those documents. Um, do you now have any recollection of those meetings or, or, or what was what the concerns were about the, the parameters of the proposed scheme other than what's set out in, in, in the e e emails and, and, and letters that you wrote at the time? Those are um, 
the stated objections, I think they're, they're stated very, very clearly in writing. They're not in front of us on the screen, but um, they, they're very clearly there. And I think you can see that from the start, we were welcoming the breakthrough in terms of finally getting government acceptance that they would set up a financial assistance scheme. But from the start, um, we were raising concerns about the detail of that scheme, but we'd need to go to the other documents, I think, which set out specifically the yes. objections that we raised. Just so that there's no mystery for those who are listening, I, I won't go to, to, I think we've got three documents, two letters to Richard Gotowski from you and one email to Peter Stevens from you, but we'll, we'll just go to one to in, illustrate the kind of issues that the Society was raising. DHSC 0004520 underscore 002. So this is from you to um, Mr. Gotowski, uh, Head of Blood Policy Division, Department of Health, 17th of October 2003. Um, you refer to a, a meeting at the department and to you now having had the opportunity to consult the Society's Trustee Board. Um, and then we can see the third paragraph, you say we have some very significant concerns. Disappointment with the actual sums of money to be offered, which fall far short of those proposed by our own expert working group and by Lord Ross's independent expert group in Scotland. Um, and then you set out what the society saw as a number of omissions from the scheme, no provision for those who died, nothing for those who've cleared the virus, um, opting for cirrhosis as the trigger for the higher payments excludes many who may be suffering from uh, um, serious advanced liver disease and damage. Scheme doesn't properly include the HIV, HCV co-infected group. Um, uh, and then top of the next page, you say, in view of these concerns, the society would not find it possible at the moment to support the government's proposed package. Um, it, it, um, and you, you've set out a hope that there'll be urgent discussions with ministers and officials about these points. C can you recall whether there were any such further discussions that you were privy to? I can't. Um, so uh, I can't really add to that, but I think it's important to note there the, the final sentence the all-party group on haemophilia um, is, was um, a group of parliamentarians through whom we could raise concerns, and it's likely that they did raise concerns, but I can't remember at this point what, if any, whether we had a, um, a response to our request for urgent discussions and officials. So I, I note the time. I probably got another 15 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes or so of questions um, for Ms. Pappenheim myself. Uh, and then there is the opportunity that needs to be afforded to representatives of core participants and core participants to suggest questions. Well, let, let, me, let me put the, the question to Ms. Pappenheim. Um, we can take a break now. What that means is that after 20 minutes or so, We'll come back. There will be a further 15 uh, minutes or thereabouts questioning. Then there will be another break um, during which um, Council will feed, uh, will uh, take, in, take on board uh, any questions, further questions for you from core participants. Um, or, so that's one where we have a, a, we have a, a break. 15 minutes, a break, and a final bit of hearing. Or we can go on 15 minutes now, have a break, and then come back. The choice is, is yours. If you need a break now, we'll take a break now. If you want to go on for 15 minutes, we will do. I think it would be preferable to go on for another 15 minutes because then we've concluded this section, as it were. So I'm happy to do that. Very well. So, Ms. Pappenheim, we, we, we've heard from, the inquiry has heard from some of those involved with the Alliance House organisations, in particular the McFarlane Trust, that they felt it was not appropriate for them to undertake campaigning activities and that this was exclusively a job for the Haemophilia Society. Was, was that ever discussed by the McFarlane Trust um, with 
with you at the Haemophilia Society? I don't recall a specific um, discussion taking place about, about that topic, but I think if I'm understanding you correctly, there's an inference that the McFarlane Trust wanted the society to campaign on issues because they felt that they couldn't, if I've understood you correctly. Yes, the evidence the inquiries heard from some of those involved um, suggests that they thought it wasn't part of their role or remit to campaign at the McFarlane Trust and that any campaigning should be done by the Haemophilia Society. And really, it's it's just a factual question. Was that was that something that was raised by the McFarlane Trust with, with you, as far as you can recall? I think it is. It's a factual statement because their role as the trust was to dispense the financial assistance and they wouldn't have been um, empowered to campaign, as it were. So I think that that would be a statement of the fact. Um, and personally, in my role, I would have expected that that would be the truth, <laughs> that we could campaign, but they could not. Did the McFarlane Trust ever come to you, um, um, its chair or trustees, and, and say to you, um, we think we need more money, we're putting in a bid to the Department of Health for that money, we don't feel able to campaign, but will you, the Haemophilia Society, um, uh, actively campaign for um, uh, greater funding to be provided to us? I don't have any re recollection of such a direct request as that. I think what, what I've referred to in my written evidence is that there was an understanding that um, the money provided for the McFarlane Trust was probably not enough to meet all of the needs, and that would have been known to me. But I don't have any recollection of such a specific request as you've described. Um, we, we've looked at the various materials um, uh, in the course of today at the focus of the uh, Haemophilia Society's campaign on the government in terms of recompense and, and, and a moral responsibility. D did the society ever consider advancing um, any kind of moral case um, against or, or in respect of pharmaceutical companies? Or, or was it very much focused upon the government and the government alone? It was focused on the government very much um, and you know bearing in mind that we are talking about a national health service um, for which the government is ultimately responsible so uh, I, I have no recollection of any discussion about what you've described. Now in, in terms of financial recompense, assistance, hardship, however one wants to, to term it, in, in the years that we've been looking at during your tenure 1998 onwards the campaigning in relation to, fina relation to financial assistance seems to have been squarely based upon securing assistance for those infected with hepatitis C. What, was anything being done at the time to campaign for more help, more financial help, for those infected with HIV? Um, to my recollection, I don't have a memory of that. Um, I suppose we have to bear in mind that those who were infected with HIV were also infected with hepatitis C. They would be co-infected, but um, I don't recall us actually campaigning. I don't think there's been any evidence provided from the Haemophilia Society of a SOLAS campaign on um, those infected with HIV. I don't think so, from my memory today. Um, and and c c can you recall whether the society, again, during the years in which y you were there, um, ever campaigned for uh, financial support for those who were um, bereaved, um, other than, as we've seen in relation to the, 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 the hepatitis C campaign, or those who were caring for family members or partners who were infected? I think you, you've seen that when we actually got to the, the moment of the reality of a scheme actually potentially becoming available, that we very much put those 
those needs and those groups to the fore. Um, but again, if your question is, did we run a SOLAS very specific campaign um, on those particular um, groups of members, uh, I do not recall that we did. Um, but you know, ultimately they would have been included, we hoped, I guess, in any scheme that was set up. We were mindful of, of those issues, but you know, your question is about, did we run a SOLAS campaign? And probably not quite in that sense, I think. Um, just dealing with them with the campaign in relation to recombinant, what was your understanding of the reasons for the government's resistance to or delay in making recombinant available for all? Was, was it always the, just a question of finance or, or were there other matters in issue? Financial. Um, I would say that was my our understanding that recombinant was more costly and it was financial. Um, you've been provided, um, I know, with some um, statements or parts of statements from individuals who have given evidence um, to the inquiry um, in which co concerns are expressed about um, the, the Haemophilia Society. Um, and one of the concerns expressed about the Haemophilia Society was a sense that the Haemophilia Society was trying to move the focus away from the infected haemophiliacs of the past towards a new generation or trying to distance itself from those in particular infected with HIV. Um, do, do you have any observation to make upon that? Well, I would say that that's an inaccurate representation of the Haemophilia Society's work because throughout the time that I was in post, we provided services, which you can see demonstrated, I've talked about them in writing and in the bulletin. We tried to provide services for the entire community, children, young people, older people. So it was a very large task for the Haemophilia Society, but we were trying to provide services and support for all, all generations um, and all who were affected. And there was no, certainly not in my mind, any, any sense that we wished to prioritize one group over another, but we were trying to do a very challenging thing as a smallish charity in meeting all of those needs the community. We've looked at um, some evidence about the position in Scotland and a divergence between the Haemophilia Society's campaign as a whole and, and um, the, the priorities within Scotland. C can, can you recall any divergence or, or, or concerns or dissent being expressed in relation to Wales and those um, who, who were m members of groups in Wales? Nothing specific, no, not from memory. Um, the, the documents refer uh, at various places to, to two, um, what I think were called at one stage special interest groups within the society, so the, the Manor House group and the Birchgrove group. I, I, is it right that both those groups, at, at different, possibly at different times, effectively severed their ties with the Haemophilia Society? Yes, I've covered this in, in my written evidence. So um, when I first joined the society, I think relations were strained between the two groups um, and the society was trying to maintain the two groups within our organization. Um, and so over the course of time, as I think I've said in my written evidence, I, I believe that both those groups decided to separate out from from the society, but there's more detail in my written. Um, can I then um, ask you to look at two documents um, on a separate topic? Um, 
uh, so they're on the same topic, but separate from the topics we've been discussing. HSAC 0012920, first of all. Um, if we go to the second page, we can see a heading working with commercial organisations and paragraph two says the purpose of this policy is to set out a clear framework for the society's relations with commercial companies, particularly those which manufacture and market treatment products relevant to our membership group. We acknowledge the importance of the financial support provided to the society from commercial companies, which is a significant part of our funding basis of charity. At the same time, the society must protect its independence and we need to safeguard that independence carefully in our relationship with funders. And then... We, I'm not going to go through the detail of it, but you set out a number of principles um, on the bottom half of the page, and then the next page, um, a, a number of specific rules to regulate the society's relationship with commercial organisations. Um, was this being introduced for the first time? Um, uh, as far as you can recall, it's May 1999 is the date of the document. Or, or had there been some kind of policy along these lines before you joined the society? Um, my feeling is that there may not have been, but um, I, I can't really um, give a, an explicit concrete answer to that because... This is the piece of work which I produced, um, and I think it's very, very clear and is based on um, good practice, if you like, in, in the charity sector at the time. But I, I'm afraid I can't remember whether there was any precursor to this. Uh, then, um, uh, 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 so same topic but different document, HSOC 00200091 underscore 012, please, Shane Mick. Thirtieth of March two thousand and four. Uh, it's a report. It starts with it's an update on the Scottish project slash devolution. I'm not going to ask you about that. But if we go to page five, under the heading corporates, it says pharmaceutical company support for the society currently averages around one hundred and fifty thousand pounds per year. And, and then there's a reference as to what kind of proportion of that could go to Scotland if there was a separate Scottish organisation. Um, now that's a not insignificant sum of money. Was, were there any concerns in the society about accepting funding from pharmaceutical companies to, to this magnitude in, in light of the, the, the history of the society's members' lives being, being uh, damaged by their products? Um, I don't recall that being expressed. Um, so I, I don't, uh, from memory, have any recollection of that, certainly not in my work as CEO and at board level. But obviously, in accepting funding from corporates, we just looked at those very, very clear guidelines, which were explicitly to ensure the independence of the charity um, and that accepting funding from those sources should not compromise the independence of the charity. So under those guidelines, um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I think as far as the board was concerned at the time, it was um, a useful source of funding, given that we've already talked about all of the work that the charity wanted to do and the need to resource it and that it that work could not be solely supported by the government grants, so we had to raise money from other sources. And were members aware of the level of funding that the society received? I, I don't mean aware, because they could have gone to the effort of looking at the, the, the society's accounts if they wanted to, but did the society take steps to ensure that members were told, whether through the bulletin or through some other means, um, that funding of this kind was, was received by the society? Yes, I think so, because um, we generally, in the communications, um, 
mentioned uh, where, where support and sponsorship might be coming in for specific activities. So I think you can see quite a lot of examples of that from publications and uh, stating where the, the um, company sponsorship, naming the company sponsors. But uh, as you say, the statutory report and accounts were published and I believe that that would have to be verified by checking the minutes. We would have reported at the AGM um, on the financial position for the charity as that would be a normal part of the AGM. So I, I think we communicated this to members sufficiently. And then I've just got a couple of questions arising out of your statement, um, Ms. Pappenheim. WITN 450401, please, Shay Mick. And if we go to page 19, please. Paragraph 67, um, in, you were asked the question to what extent, if any, did representatives of pharmaceutical companies assist in proposing or editing or selecting material for the Haemophilia Society's publications? <coughs> and you say the pharmaceutical companies had no direct involvement in selection of material for publication, and then you go on to talk about the editorial process. Um, what, what did you mean by no direct involvement? Did, did pharmaceutical companies have some form of indirect involvement in the selection of material for publication? No, that wasn't my implication. I think I was just trying to answer the question, which is, is quite a direct question. What, to what extent did representatives of the companies assist in proposing or editing? So that, I was trying to answer that question that um, they were not involved in the selection of material for publication. I wasn't implying that they had indirect, I was just trying to answer the question directly. And then if we go to page four, and this is on a different topic, paragraph 11, um, you refer in paragraph 11 to the greater focus on other um, bleeding disorders, notably von Willebrand's widening the scope of the charity's work to women, launch of the Women's Project as the charity was recognising and seeking to engage with women affected by von Willebrand's whose needs had not been addressed previously. Um, did, did you gain any understanding as to why the needs of females with bleeding disorders had not been previously addressed? Um, that is a large topic in its own right, I think. So, um, it, it would be complex to answer, probably, why that might not have been the case. I think my, my recollection um, is that a lot of women had suffered the effects of von Willebrand's disorder um, and that those hadn't been identified as von Willebrand's disorder. So it, it turned out that what had been overlooked or not understood is that potentially there were women who had um, very, very heavy periods, very long, um, prolonged periods when they'd gone to the doctor about those, um, it wasn't identified that they might have a bleeding disorder. So th there is quite a long history to all of this. And I think what, what we were um, shining a light on is that women began to come forward to tell their story of suffering for years, um, the effects of bleeding disorders, which were, well, not to be probably gone into in detail here, but they were beginning to tell their experiences um, and they, they hadn't been recognized and diagnosed as a bleeding disorder. So what we were wanting to do was engage with women, raise awareness of this, because potentially um, by raising awareness, more women could be diagnosed and provide, provided with, with help rather than continuing to suffer the effects of the bleeding disorder without any recognition or treatment. So. I hope that helps to explain. We, we can take that down. Thank you, Shemek. The final question um, um, from, from me, subject to the questions that may get um, suggested to me. Um, what interaction or relationship um, did you, you have with other um, haemophilia societies and organisations internationally? Um, a great deal. So we were members of the world um, association, the World Federation 
um, and also uh, a very active participant in the European Haemophilia Consortium for a period of time we provided the Secretariat. So we had very close contacts and connections with worldwide and we had a twinning arrangement for a period of time with the Russian society. So we, we had a great deal of contact with other societies worldwide. Uh, and was there any particular relationship or contact with the societies in, in either the USA, Canada or Ireland that you can recall? Um, specifically, probably a little bit more contact with Ireland because they would have been active members of the European um, European Haemophilia Consortium. So we had more reason to be involved with Ireland through through the European Consortium. Um, as to Canada and the US, I don't recall. So those are my questions. Um, uh, but if we could now take a break to enable core participants and legal representatives to suggest any further questions that they would wish to have considered. Yes, well, we, we won't uh, come back before five past four. Um, if by then you haven't finished fielding all, all the questions that, that come, uh, you'll let us know, and we, we'll let uh, Ms. Pappenheim know in, uh, in the usual way. Certainly, sir. Um, so otherwise, it's not before five past four.